Today I want to tell you about uh, our Gemstack adventures, which we went through with our own website. Uh, I'm Andre. I work as a developer evangelist for uh, for Content. Uh, Content is a company, is a vendor of uh, a headless CMS, or now we say Content Platform. It's a sexier term um, of the same name. So we do a Content Platform for mainly non-technical users and for developers. We we do APIs and everything. So to put you into context, uh, this is our website. Um, today I want to tell you, I want to tell you a story or. Uh, I want to tell you about what we went through on our way to Jamstack and how we navigated the Jamstack space to where we are right now. Like this is how the website looks now. Um, you can achieve, uh, you can access it at uh, content.ai. Uh, but I'll tell you a bit more about uh, how we built the site. Um, overall, it's it's nothing special. Uh, there, it mainly consists of landing pages. Uh, marketing landing pages. It has a blog section, some some functionality there, some other pages. Overall, it has about a thousand pages. Yeah, it's. I would say it's a fairly large site, but not the biggest one. Um, so we're going to be talking about this one. And first, I'm going to uh, tell you why we decided to go with Jamstack. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to tell you what Jamstack is, if there's someone who doesn't know yet. Um, then I'll tell you something about the selection process that led us initially to Gatsby. And uh, I'll tell you then about the next selection process, which led us to Next.js. Um, that's going to be a bit fun. And um, at the end, I'm going to try to make a bit of evaluation. What is uh, the best choice for today if you're starting a new project? Um, so that's just the, the rough timeline. Uh, and let's start with what Gemstack is and why you should care about that. Uh, Gemstack, uh, the term, the, the official explanation of the term has changed a few times, so I don't even know the official uh, explanation right now. But the idea is you take content, you take implementation, you put it together, and you generate as many pages as you have those content items. So you pretty much pre built everything ahead of time. And the, the great benefit is that you can take these files, you can put them on a CDN, and serve them uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, the good thing is that you don't need any processing power of the server, which is which is great. Uh, it's very cheap to host these things. You can handle traffic peaks and everything, so it was kind of nice. Now it started as something that developers really liked, and um, uh, they started to work um, or they started to incorporate Jamstack into their daily routine. So they wanted to do projects on Jamstack. But the thing is, we quickly figured out that uh, Jamstack is a bit underwhelming. Because on majority of sites, if it's anything bigger than your dog's site, um, you need some kind of dynamic functionality, uh, be it uh, forms, uh, be it search functionality, uh, be it a shopping cart, um, just to name a few. So what we did is we added serverless functions, these little pieces of code that you can uh, you know, scale separately, you can uh, host them uh, anywhere, and we used to proxy every uh, you know, dynamic functionality that was happening on the, on the site through these serverless functions to get the data back in uh, the server space. You know? Because Gemstack only allowed you to do dynamic functionalities on the client side. Yeah, that, was the, that was the only option. Um, so that's what, uh, what Gemstack used to be. Um, and Gemstack stands for JavaScript APIs and Markup. That's the gem in, in the Gemstack. Now, a lot of people see it as um, JavaScript is the, is the mandatory component there, but it only refers to the client side of uh, the website. So if you don't need any dynamic functionality on your website, you don't need to use JavaScript, right? If you like copy-pasting or you want to punish yourself for something, you can also you know, copy-paste the 1,000 pages and, uh, and have it built that way. It's, it's perfectly fine, and it will be a Jamstack site. But um, what I like to say about JavaScript is that it gives you uh, smart, I, I call them smart frameworks. The thing is, uh, the non-JS frameworks, they are fast, they, they, can, be, uh, they can generate everything just, just as the JavaScript frameworks, but they don't give you the client-side bundle, um, the, the dynamic functionality you have on the client. Um, that's, that's a big problem, because on any larger site, you always need some kind of dynamic functionality. Yeah? Um, how many times you use the React hooks, right? There, there's always something on, on the website. So the JavaScript frameworks, they have a large benefit in there um, that they can compile everything in a bundle and ship it with, with your site. And it comes with also other benefits like service workers and, and others. I'm going to talk about, about that um, later. 
Uh, why I'm saying JavaScript or not is that the majority of our clients, and we are focusing on enterprise clients, uh, they, they uh, always evaluate only the JavaScript frameworks <clears throat> because the, the non-JavaScript frameworks are just not a good fit functionality-wise. Yeah? So there always needs to be the client-side bundle. So that's why we also decided to use a JavaScript framework. Uh, and to do a short detour into history, um, you know, to understand why we uh, arrived at Jamstack the way we did, um, content is built by Kentico, and Kentico is historically a .NET company. Um, both our products, both our CMSs uh, are built on .NET. Uh, and that means we also had an army of .NET developers in the company, which meant also our website was originally built with uh, ASP.NET and MVC. It was hosted on Azure, uh, and there was a proper caching setup, everything was working fine, until about four years ago, uh, someone decided it was a great idea to transfer the ownership of the website to a marketing department. And at the time, we had uh, the main guy on the project was uh, a front-endist, um, and uh, he was even external, so we, uh, we were outsourcing that. Um, and he was fighting a lot with uh, the deployment um, pipelines in Azure. Uh, he couldn't do any proper um, architectural decisions about the website because it was a foreign platform for him. Um, which in the end meant that uh, <clears throat> the development got expensive and it was slow. We were spending a lot of time on just maintenance. And uh, the marketing team tried to hire another .NET developer to work on the website full time. But uh, it was not that easy uh, because, you know, if you tell someone you're going to be the only one working on this website and it's a .NET and nobody knows how everything works, it's not the best job description, you know. So uh, it, was, it was hard to find someone. Um, and uh, when Gemstack came, and uh, uh, we were talking about benefits like uh, easy hosting, you know, scalability, um, nice developer experience, and uh, security by default, you know, all these things, there was music to stakeholders' ears. So um, that was the first uh, reason why we moved to, to Gemstack, or why we considered Gemstack in the first place. Um, it was at the time also much easier to find a JavaScript developer. Uh, and it was cheaper as well. Uh, not that it would be a deciding factor for a platform change. Um, and the last uh, factor was that uh, we were just initiating a partnership of our company with uh, Gatsby. And uh, we had the first version of the content Gatsby source plugin built. Uh, so we were able to do some kind of a dog fooding uh, for, for the plugin. So uh, we decided to go uh, with, with Gatsby for, uh, for those reasons. Now, why did we decide to go with React? It sounds so easy when I talk about it now, but we were making a lot of decisions back then. And uh, when you decide to go with JavaScript, you have three options. You can go with React, Angular, or Vue. Or at least it was back then that way. Uh, we decided to go with React because the majority of develop development that we do uh, in-house is done in React. So we had the knowledge in-house. And back then, uh, to be honest, uh, Angular was, uh, we could have also used Angular, but uh, it didn't offer good enough static site generator. Uh, and I, I think that is the same now. Uh, and we didn't want to use Vue.js because back then it was only options API. And uh, uh, that, that didn't seem like a good fit for a very large project. So we went with React. And uh, we used Gatsby because, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, Gatsby had a really good marketing. Um, it seemed like the benefits were really good. So we decided to go with Gatsby. And uh, that, that, was, that was it. And back then, I didn't know about Next.js at all. So uh, it was a quite simple choice. Now, um, so we migrated the website to Gatsby. Took us a while, and uh, now is Gatsby delivering on its promises, or was Gatsby delivering on its promises? Uh, first, I'll, I'll try to go through things that were nice, that uh, were fulfilled. Then I'm going to switch to um, the bad things. That's going to be more interesting. So first of all, Gatsby promised that it's going to be easy to start, right? Um, Gatsby works with GraphQL, uh, so when we you know, connected Gatsby to, to our uh, CMS. Um, we were presented with, with this view. It's a graphical, it's a tool that is shipped with Gatsby out of the box. And it lets you like click through the content items that are available. And you know, your GraphQL query is being composed on the right side 
just like that. So this was really nice. The, the greatest benefit is that you don't have to read any documentation. It's just there. Um, then we added the GraphQL schema, so the, the yellow items that you see there, it's also the modular content, yeah? what the editor decides to put there. We don't know ahead of time, but we know what types are there. So it was really easy from a developer's perspective to know what kind of data we can expect. So this was nice. GraphQL made things easy. Yeah, those were the arrows. Uh, the next thing was easy implementation of client-side features. Now, we were used to uh, the .NET MVC, so now we were able to write everything in a single place. Yeah? Um, what you see here is the implementation of blog post filtering on uh, a blog post page, I guess, but it's happening on the client side. Um, and the great thing was that we didn't have to include any bundles, but Gatsby would uh, automatically take the code, put it into the client bundle, and handle everything for us. So it was really easy to implement client-side features. Then the, the biggest uh, thing that the Gatsby markets is uh, there is a plugin for everything. So when you need to solve things like, uh, uh, I have a Google Tag Manager here, Google Analytics, uh, Intercom, we were using Auth0, uh, smart recommendations. For many of these things, you would just find a plugin and you would plug it into your site, configure it, and that's it. You know, it, it just magically works like that. So this was also nice, it saves a lot of time. Yeah, these are the plugins. And uh, the site performance, well, our website was pretty, uh, pretty good performance-wise. So we were not, like, the, the site performance wasn't the deciding factor why we wanted to go to a different platform. But uh, Gatsby has one great feature, an advantage, uh, and that is uh, the, the service worker and the fact that it can store files in your browser. So it actually, as you browse the website, um, Gatsby anticipates what are you, um, you know, likely to visit next and downloads the data of that page uh, ahead of time. So when you actually click on something, um, you don't need to do the round trip to the server, but um, uh, the, your browser can render the page on its own because it already has the data. So this was a really nice uh, visitor experience improvement. And um, it also means that Gatsby can um, make your site work offline. So this was a nice, nice uh, thing to have. And uh, the last uh, big thing here was that uh, we were able to uh, improve the speed of development and deployment. The junior JavaScript developer that joined the team and uh, worked on the project uh, was onboarded in a week and started delivering features right away. So this was really nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's all for the good stuff. Now let's move on to the bad stuff. Gatsby in its first versions was uh, really only static site generator and client-side JavaScript, right? So we figured we needed a server anyway. Uh, we had some dynamic functionalities on the website, as I said, some private sections. Uh, we had some API routes for, uh, for additional features we had on the site. Um, we, were doing, we, we needed to do reCAPTCHA uh, validation and these things. So we ended up having uh, another project on Azure anyway that was handling all these dynamic functionalities for us. And we have it there to this day. Uh, we're slowly trying to get rid of that. So this was, this was kind of a bad thing. Um, and I said that the GraphQL was, uh, was a nice thing to have in the beginning. Um, then it became um, you know, exactly the opposite. Um, it became totally unmaintainable. If you just, the only way how you could you know, edit the GraphQL query and, and add something or debug something while you're not seeing something, uh, was that you would just copy the whole thing into the graphical and, uh, and let it parse the query and then you know, edit it and copy it back. Um, you might be thinking like, yeah, he just put the, the worst GraphQL query on, on the slide and yeah, it's, it, it doesn't look that bad. So this is a, this is a 404 page, yeah? So it's, it's fairly a simple page. Um, but if it, this is not enough, then this is a blog post page. Now I'll give you a minute, yeah? Yeah, and it gets worse. So um, it, it's, it, it was like a both good thing and a bad thing in a way, but that's not even the worst thing. Um, the dynamic pages in Gatsby work in a way that you get a node ID of a specific item, so it's identifier of some item, and you provide that to a template. The template takes the node ID and does its own GraphQL query where it fetches all the data it needs, um, you know, combines it with the JavaScript code and renders the HTML, 
and there you have your page. Now, this is fine. So far, so good. The thing is, as your website grows, you have so many templates that have exactly zero relation to where the page actually exists, on which URLs it actually exists. So you have to set up some kind of a naming convention uh, just to not have one big folder of all the templates. Uh, and all, of, uh, or all the developers of your team must uh, follow that same convention. Yeah? Otherwise, you see these, these are all the templates that, that we had on our website. It's, it's a lot of things. Um, and then, of course, if you're wondering where do those node IDs come from, uh, that's the best part. That's the best magic here. Um, <clears throat> there is a magic file called gatsby-node.js where you need to do two things. First, you need to create a GraphQL query that gives you all the node IDs of the items that should be used you know, for the generation. Um, and then you need to call a special function of Gatsby that, where you say, on this URL, render a page with this node ID and this template. Um, that doesn't sound so bad, right? The only bad thing is that, and you might have noticed that we're around line number 800, you need to do this for every single template, every single type of page. And uh, our Gatsby node file had around 1.3k lines, which means if you need to find something, a misbehaving page, whatever, on which URL it is, um, it could be a task for a few hours. Yeah, so it's, it's really a big mess. Uh, so yeah, that was that. Was that. And uh, the worst thing of all was an unbearable editor experience. Now, if you're thinking, all right, we build the site, we publish it somewhere, and we don't really care too much about how long the build takes, um, that's fine for the visitors, but not for editors, because they always need to check you know, the, when they create a page, how the page looks like before they hit publish. So this is Jeanette, our content editor, uh, or one of them. Um, and whenever she would change something in the CMS, she would wait 25 minutes for Gatsby, or our, our site build took 25 minutes. Um, and I don't think it's only because of the implementation. Yeah? Um, so she would need to wait that long for her to see the preview. And if the preview looks good, then she would uh, need to wait another half an hour for the production. Hi there, I'm Janetta. I'm a content creator and editor. And the reason why I'm not so excited about Gatsby right now is the preview. Basically, if I want to see my latest content changes, I need to wait around 25 minutes and then if the page doesn't look too good and I need to make some more tweaks, I have to wait another 25 minutes to check how it looks. And because of all this waiting, a simple landing page that you would probably create in less than an hour can easily take up your entire day, which is a bit frustrating, I would say, and it forces you to switch between tasks and you know, you feel like all you do is just waiting, waiting, and waiting. Now, she looks sad by default, yeah? <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, she got pregnant and now is on maternity leave, so who knows, yeah? Um, but uh, that was, that was, that was the, the main uh, problem why we decided to look for another platform. And uh, the only platform that we were looking at was Next.js because we wanted to keep using React. Um, and we wanted to, keep, to reuse as many of components as possible so that you know, the migration effort isn't that huge uh, because we can't really uh, afford to not deliver features for half a year. Yeah? Um, so um, these are the things that I talked about. Now, to be fair, uh, since our initial implementation on Gatsby, uh, both frameworks evolved a lot. Yeah? So many of those problems are already solved. Um, so when I compare these two, I'm, I'm going to try to um, tell you how they try to solve the problems. Uh, but it's still not a complete overview. Yeah? It's still uh, problems of our large site. Yeah? Um, so when it comes to a need of backend app, uh, now both of these frameworks allow you to create API routes in the implementation. They get, um, uh, during the deployment process, they are um, deployed to, um, to a separate you know, storage where you have the serverless functions. So uh, that's, that's a tie. Both frameworks uh, have that now. However, when we come to the unmaintainability of dynamic pages, that is in Gatsby to this day. Uh, they tried to solve it with uh, introducing the file system route API, which wasn't really a bad idea. Um, the way how it works is that um, in the file name, you have a you know, GraphQL path to a specific uh, uh, value in the node storage. That is the URL slug on which the page is going to exist. 
The problem is this solution gives you exactly zero flexibility. Um, if, if you need to filter those, those items, if you need to um, add a language code, you know, uh, at the, as, as the first directory of all the pages, um, it's simply not possible. Yeah? And you need to go back into Gatsby Note and have the 1.5k file where you will not find anything. Uh, when you look at Next.js, Next.js is a standard file name routing, uh, which I think is a standard now on other frameworks as well which is great because uh, it only gives you all the parameters uh, on the way to your page and lets you handle the rest in code, which is, which is nice and gives you full flexibility. And it also lets you find any page really easily. If you have the URL, you can easily find a code file that is responsible for rendering that page. So also a nice developer experience. So one point next JS. Um, the bad editor experience, is still there, but it was greatly improved in Gatsby. Uh, because Gatsby knew this was a problem, so they introduced incremental builds, um, which are kind of depending on the CMS. So the CMS sends a webhook to Gatsby saying, hey, there was a content change. You should update your nodes in the local storage. And uh, Gatsby you know, updates that thing and rebuilds only the pages that are you know, directly affected by that change. Uh, which is nice. Uh, the preview takes, let's say, two, four, five seconds. Um, but uh, the problem is it was uh, directly depending on Gatsby Cloud. Gatsby Cloud is a hosting platform provided by Gatsby. And until last year, you had to be on an enterprise plan, which was uh, $1K plus a month. Uh, so that was a major deal breaker for us. Yeah, we're not spending that for uh, website hosting. Uh, these days, uh, they also have incremental builds in the free plans, so uh, it's, it's fine to use it, but back then it was just not the possibility. Uh, the point goes to Next, though, because in Next.js, um, you get the server-rendered server previews for free. The same implementation that you have for the statically generated page, you can use for server-side rendering, uh, because it just runs the code you know, using a serverless function. So it's much much better experience for editors. And uh, very slow builds, Gatsby tried to solve it uh, with um, uh, parallelizing the query resolution. Uh, so in other words, they just threw more hardware on it, uh, which kind of worked. I think they had like 40% improvement. Uh, and it was on Gatsby Cloud, so uh, you didn't care. It wasn't your money that were being burned. Um, Next.js is, uh, again, a little bit better. Uh, just to illustrate, on our site, our implementation currently takes about three minutes on Next.js to build the whole static site. On Gatsby, it was 25, so uh, quite a big difference. Um, Next.js was trying to solve the long builds with uh, a Rust compiler, or is actually still trying. Um, but still, I think that uh, three minutes is a bit too long, um, so that's why they, they get only half point. Um, so that's for the slow builds. Now, we don't really, in Next.js, we don't really care about the build times all that much. And uh, the reason is the rendering modes. Now, to illustrate how the rendering modes are different between Next.js and Gatsby, um, this, uh, this is an explanation of uh, how Gatsby works. So uh, with Gatsby, if you're running you know, locally, if you're, if you're developing the site, or if you're in production, you're doing a production build, it doesn't matter. The first thing you need to do is get all the content from the CMS. So you're pretty much uh, doing an export of everything into uh, the local node storage, where Gatsby turns all the, the data into local nodes uh, so that you can work with GraphQL. Now, when we had a static site, you would then use all those nodes and generate all the static pages. Um, this was a problem because it took, took too long. And uh, that's why they came with an idea of deferred static generation. So um, you would say some of the pages in the website are not that important, so we don't have to pre-build everything. Yeah, if you had 10,000 blog posts, you would pre-build, let's say, 100 latest ones. Um, so that worked. That took, obviously, that took the build times down. And if there was a request to that page, um, Gatsby would uh, then generate the page on demand. It would take a look at the local nodes and generate the page uh, you know, locally on the hosting platform. Uh, in that case, uh, Gatsby was directly depending on the CMS sending all the content updates to Gatsby, uh, because otherwise it would be working with, uh, uh, with outdated content. Uh, Next.js does it a bit differently, where each page fetches content on its own. So in each page, you are doing uh, API queries, 
uh, or you're, you're fetching data from anywhere, depends on what is your you know, source of truth system. Um, and uh, Next.js doesn't let you, by default, defer uh, the pages. Like, it's implementable, but not out of the box. Uh, but it features uh, incremental static regeneration, which is the rendering mode that allows you to set um, time of validity for every single page. So it's not helping you with the initial build, uh, but it's gonna help you that you can say for each page, there is a time of validity for, let's say, 10 minutes. And uh, if there is a request that comes to that page after those 10 minutes, Next.js will automatically regenerate that page, uh, which means you don't really have to rebuild the whole website ever if you don't make a code change. Yeah, in that case, Next.js will automatically keep your uh, website uh, current. And uh, uh, in the, the new implementation of Next, uh, I'm not sure about the version number now, but uh, you can also proactively remove a cached page. Yeah, so if you set the timeout to 10 minutes, but you already know that there is a changed content that's affecting that page, uh, based on a webhook, you can uh, remove you know, uh, that, uh, that page and regenerate it again. So uh, again, that's a point for next. And uh, now let's move on to uh, the fun part of the presentation. How did the migration go from Gatsby to next? Um, there were a bunch of problems that uh, we experienced a bit too late. But uh, first of them was misused API routes. That comes from uh, the way how Gatsby um, looks at components and pages, uh, because it uh, lets all the, uh, all the building blocks, let's call them, uh, to fetch data from the local node storage. So we had a lot of components that were fetching data, that were working with the data locally. And that was a problem, because Next.js doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, with Next, it's only the page that can uh, fetch data during build time. So um, we found out about this a bit too late, so we had to introduce uh, a few API routes, and we actually fetched the data client-side for some of the components. Uh, and this is still a technical depth that, that we need to figure out uh, and are slowly working uh, you know, to not have it there. Uh, but it's one you know, structural thing. Uh, next thing was, a, was TypeScript. Now, Gatsby added TypeScript last year, so it's also possible to use uh, TypeScript with Gatsby now. Um, but uh, we started with, uh, uh, with uh, generating all the models from the CMS, because Next.js supported TypeScript by default. And uh, why we did that is because we have all the content in a single place, so we generated all the content types into strongly typed models. Uh, this allowed us to do two things. Uh, or gave us two really great benefits, is that all the components that we had, um, and that we're just hoping that the data are going to make it all the way to the component, we were able to make them uh, use TypeScript, use the strongly typed models. So we were able to uh, like pinpoint everything, and in case there was a change, we would regenerate the model, and you would see before build that there is a problem in the component, and it's you know expecting data it will never uh, be able to get. So that was one thing. We used the models on all components. And the next thing was that the model generator also uh, created a large file with the project structure and all the code names as constants. So what it enabled us to do is to get rid of all the string literals in our code. And we were able to use um, uh, these constants everywhere that will automatically generate it, which, for one thing, effectively removed any possibilities for typos in the data queries. And for other thing, um, if website is your only channel, you can also go the other way around. Like if you have uh, outdated content types on the CMS that you are afraid to delete, and we have a lot of those, and we are really afraid to delete them. Um, in that case, you can uh, just find out if there are any references to those code names, and if there are not, and website is your only channel, then you can safely remove it. So a nice thing. And a side effect that, uh, that we found out on Next.js is that whenever we build something that is, uh, that is uh, uh, built this way, you know, with strongly typed models, uh, and there is a problem with content, that some content is just not there where it should be, uh, we get this nice error saying exactly on which page there is a problem. Uh, now, I can't stress enough how much this really helps with, with the development. Otherwise, these errors would, uh, would uh, probably be on production. So a very nice thing. 
Uh, next thing, uh, Next.js is not opinionated when it comes to data fetching. So uh, you might have noticed that on the previous slides that we had to figure out a way to get the data into that platform. And of course, we used our TypeScript SDK. Uh, but uh, there are, uh, we had to create a singleton with two instances of the SDK because there, there is the published site and there is the server side rendered previews. Yeah? So we had to kind of figure out how to uh, get the data at the right time from the right uh, project into that implementation. So overall, it, uh, it requires uh, uh, an effort, development effort on your side to uh, figure out the data fetching. Um, one thing that is connected to this is uh, API usage. Uh, I mentioned that the, get the Gatsby fetches all the content um, before it builds the site. Uh, with Next.js, we are currently averaging around 2.5 API queries per page, and we have about 1,000 pages, so that means 2,500 uh, API queries for every build. So if you're being charged for API usage, this might be something to, uh, to look at and maybe implement some kind of caching or something like that. Um, and another thing that we found out when we were uh, already putting the website to production is that on a layout component, uh, we had a React hook that contained this a bit of code that was only supposed to execute some kind of carousel on the page. Um, why I have it here is that this single React hook for that small functionality actually turned our nice static site into pretty much a large uh, single page application. Um, because what Next.js would do is it would pack everything in a JSON file and serve it to the clients. Yeah? So the page would be rendered only on client. Uh, we found out because we ran some SEO tests and uh, uh, we were not having the, the right results. So uh, this was actually the cause and we had it on layout, so it wasn't very nice. Um, and the, the next thing was a preview of not yet published items didn't work. Um, that is because in Next.js, uh, when you're generating pages dynamically, um, there, is, um, there is like a waterfall of these three uh, functions. Uh, first, in get static paths, you need to provide all the paths where there should be a page. Yeah? So you do a fetch of, uh, from the CMS, and you provide all the URL slugs that, uh, that will exist. Then it goes to get static props, where you fetch the actual data for that page based on the slug. And you do some, some processing, you, you get some additional data for layouts and so on. And then you take that data and give it to uh, the page code where you render the, the HTML. Now the problem is, you only get the information about the preview mode in get static props, uh, which makes sense because you never run get static paths um, uh, during runtime. Yeah, it's always build time where you, get, where you fetch the paths. Um, so the problem was when editor created a page, that page was never published before, and in get static, so it couldn't have been in get static paths. And therefore, when next uh, JS saw a, a slug that wasn't provided, it would <coughs> redirect the user back to a 404 page because it just doesn't exist. Um, this is fortunately easily solvable. Uh, in get static paths, you just need to say fall back to true or fall back to blocking, so it's it's solvable. But then it's your uh, responsibility to do the redirect if the page should not exist. So you have to uh, implement the data fetching a bit more defensively because it might happen that the slug doesn't exist. And in that case, you need to return the 404. Um, but even if the page exists in draft and you want to render the preview of the page because it exists, you have to be much more careful because in the CMS, when it's in draft, it's not enforcing any content rules, right? If there are some required fields and, and other stuff, um, that the CMS only checks the data when you want to publish that item. But here we are in draft, in preview mode, so you have to be very careful you know, to, to not get a lot of errors on the page because of missing data. And uh, yeah, the rendering modes of pages are a big thing to learn. Like I explained to you how Gatsby works and how ISR works in Next, um, but it's generally it's it's hard to understand all the rendering modes and apply them at the right time. But the thing with Next.js, we don't really care that much because we are hosting on Versal, and the build takes three minutes. Versal is not charging us for the build minutes, so we don't really care how many builds we do. Um, the 
Editor previews are server rendered, so we don't care about editor experience as well because it's perfect. Um, and when something goes to, uh, to production, uh, five minutes is a perfectly fine time to, to wait for a change to appear there. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that, um, well, our site is not using ISR yet. For those reasons, we're, we're always, whenever there is a content change, we always rebuild the whole site and we always switch it for production. Um, but the great thing is that if our site grows, we really have a lot of room where we can grow. Yeah, we can implement the ISR and take the builds down, uh, build times down, which wasn't an option that we had with Gatsby. <clears throat> so, was it worth the effort to go from Gatsby to Next.js? Um, first thing is, we dramatically improved editor experience, which was the main driver why we wanted to do the change. Um, the server-side previews work perfectly fine. It requires exactly zero development effort from you. Um, so, th that was probably the best uh, thing that emerged from the migration. We also improved developer experience because uh, now we are able to you know, navigate the repository and uh, uh, the developer, don't, don't uh, tell him I told you that, but uh, uh, the second day we were working on the migration, he told me he loves React and he wants to you know, write blog posts about how React is cool. Um, so, uh, the developer experience was really, really uh, improved. Uh, we were able to get the front end and back end in a single project. So now when we need to do server side stuff, we can you know, uh, remove the, the .NET app in Azure and we can have everything in a single place and have it deliver, uh, deployed and delivered on the single platform where we have everything. Um, we got way better at code maintainability. So we now know that when our project grows, we don't have to create templates, we don't have to extend the large Gatsby node file. Uh, but we know we just add one page and we can navigate through um, the, the file structure and uh, it shouldn't be a big problem even if our site grows in the future. Um, with TypeScripting, everything, we were able to catch a lot of errors before they made it to production. And even if we not catch it uh, and there is some mistake, it uh, takes down the build. So a fail, I always say that failed build is better than error on production. So we're able to uh, protect what, uh, what we can. And uh, last but not least is we have a nice base for future projects. So when we need to do something new now, we always use the same base uh, built on, on Next.js. So should you always use Next.js then? And you know, move Gatsby to the old times? Um, that depends. It's a very popular answer today, looking at the representations as well. Um, I would say, uh, or that's what I always recommend to, to people who ask me, um, Gatsby has really great advantages for beginners. Um, the speed of development, the GraphQL, um, the existence of all the plugins, uh, the ecosystem, the community around Gatsby, um, now the TypeScript support, uh, the deferred static generation which takes down the build times, and the fact that you can now host on Gatsby Cloud for, for free and you get uh, also the incremental previews. Um, that solves, I would say, like 80% of our problems that we had. So uh, I recommend Gatsby to, uh, to smaller projects or to companies that are not sure if they really want to invest in Gemstack and really want to you know, put money and, and developers on the project that they are not sure of. Um, because Gatsby will probably give you the quickest and uh, best return of investment. Uh, when it comes to Next.js, uh, it gives you way better flexibility because uh, to this day I don't know of a thing that we would not be able to do. Yeah? With Next there is always a way to, to do something um, if needed. And um, it's also a way better, like you need to spend some development efforts uh, to do the data fetching. Uh, you need to be able to navigate the JavaScript ecosystem because you need to figure out what libraries you want to use um, and, and all other things that Gatsby solves for you but uh, it gives you much better options for scaling. And uh, overall, I uh, see Next.js as a leading platform for Gemstack these days. And uh, really, from, from a perspective of a company that uses Next.js for, for their site, uh, I have only minor complaints, like there is nothing big that I could tell you to, to, to not use it. Um, right, so it depends on the project. 
And that's all from me, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter. <laughs>